The following lesson is linked to learning outcome two, reading and viewing. It addresses the assessment standard that requires learners to explore and explain key features of texts and how they contribute to meaning. Learners should be able to recognize that verse and stanza forms, rhyme, rhythm and punctuation affect meaning. Hi, I'm Charlotte. This series of lessons deals with poetry, a very important part of your English studies. So we will be focusing on teaching you how to study poetry and suggest some reasons why we study poetry. I'll be giving you some ideas of what to look for when you are working with a poem and hopefully I can encourage all of you to try your hand at writing your own poetry. In this lesson, we will be looking at what makes poetry different from any other writing. We look at specific poems and extracts from well-known poems and talk about why they are poetry and not prose. By the end of this lesson, you should be able to differentiate between poetry and prose, list the characteristics of poetry, recognize the structure of poetry, and comment on how the structure of poetry adds to the poet's message. Now, if you have seen our previous series of lessons, you will remember the definitions of the two styles of writing we will be working with today. But let's just quickly refresh our memories. Prose. Writing loosely structured according to its purpose, used for ordinary, direct communication. So all the written communication we deal with every day is prose, like newspapers, novels and magazines. We can define poetry very generally as writing structured specifically for effect with rhythm, imagery and form. Now this is not the most comprehensive definition of poetry, but as we work through these lessons, you will understand and see these characteristics more clearly. Understanding poetry and how to work with it is important for all English students. Learning about how and why poetry was written teaches you valuable comprehension skills and these skills help you with all communication. Poets condense and intensify meaning, so you begin to learn about meaning as it appears on the surface but also about the hidden or deeper meaning. Let's begin. The Eagle by Lord Alfred Tennyson as we read this together, try and think about what makes this writing a poem. That is what we will be discussing afterwards. He clasps the crag with crooked hands, close to the sun in lonely lands, ringed with the azure world, he stands. The wrinkled sea beneath him crawls, he watches from his mountain walls, and like a thunderbolt, he falls. Now, don't you think this poem is a very effective description of the eagle? We have all seen eagles, either in pictures or in real life. We can also write down a description of the eagle and it could look something like this. Eagles wait and watch high up on mountain cliffs and then they dive down at great speed to catch their prey. And that is the essential difference between poetry and prose. Prose is written to inform directly in a straightforward way. But this poem by Tennyson was written to create a very specific picture in our minds. The eagle is impressive and majestic, and we should consider it with awe. So how does he manage to create this idea of the eagle being a magnificent creature? Let's look at some of the words that Tennyson has chosen. He clasps the crag with crooked hands. It is usual in English to refer to animals or birds in this case, as it. Here, the eagle is referred to as he, and the eagle has hands. What effect does this create? Well, the eagle is made human, and in this way, the reader can identify more closely with the bird. And then it also emphasizes this feeling of a majestic animal that Tennyson is trying to create. 
Then look at how this line sounds because of the repetition of certain letters, the k sound. Clasps and crag and crooked. This sound device is known as alliteration. So right from the first line of the poem, we are shown an unusual vision. It is important to remember that poetry tries to create a very definite image in our minds. Thanks to the human nature of the eagle and the repetition, we have a picture in our minds of a strong, powerful being holding onto the mountain as if he controls everything. Now I want you to look at the rest of the poem and think about in what other poetic ways the eagle was represented here. Look at the eagle's power as it is presented in close to the sun and also look at the use of the word azure. Azure is a very unusual word to use for blue. Notice the comparisons the poet makes in the following sentences. The wrinkled sea beneath him crawls and like a thunderbolt. The ocean lies below the eagle, accentuating its power. And then it is compared to lightning, quick and powerful. Can you see how this description encourages an emotional response in the reader and how different it is from our description that just tells us what the eagle looks like and how it behaves? Now let's look at the structure of this piece of writing that characterizes it as poetry. This is a definition that you would need to know. Stanzas are small sections of a poem. You may have heard of stanzas being referred to as verses. Stanzas is the correct term in poetry. You can only refer to verses when you are describing a song. Another way of thinking about stanzas is that they are poetic paragraphs. Let's look at the poem. This poem has two stanzas. There are two groups of lines, they are of equal length, and their rhyme is repeated. Look at the three lines in each stanza and notice the rhyme. Hands rhymes with lands and with stands. In the second stanza, crawls, walls and falls sound the same as one another too. Do you know about rhyming words? I will briefly define this for you. Rhyming words are words that sound the same. In poetry, they are most often used at the ends of stanza lines. Remember that we are focusing on the structure of poetry in this lesson, and here the rhyme contributes to the structure of the poem. The two stanzas follow the same pattern. Rhyme can also contribute to rhythm. Rhythm, a recognizable pattern of stresses in a stanza line of poetry. The accent forms a pattern. To illustrate this idea of rhythm, I would like to use two lines from another famous poem. See if you can recognize them. Tiger, tiger burning bright in the forest of the night. These are lines from a poem by William Blake. These lines are written so that a very specific thing happens when we read them out loud. Listen. Tiger, tiger burning bright in the forest of the night. Did you hear how particular words or specific parts of words were louder or more emphasized than other words? Poetry often relies on this technique and you should be able very easily to hear the pattern of lines when they are read aloud. In this poem, notice how the tie part of the word tiger is louder and then the burn part of the word burning is naturally stressed. Rhythm then is a very necessary characteristic of the structure of poetic writing. Now rhythm occurs naturally in all language, but poets select their language very carefully to create rhythm, like rap artists. Now let's quickly recap all of the things we have looked at today. Poetry has emotive and effective descriptions, stanzas, rhyme and rhythm. The next three characteristics that we will examine cross over. In other words, you will find them in almost all kinds of other writing, but they are essential in poetry. The first one we will look at 
is figurative language. Here is a definition. Figurative language. Words and language are used to extend their meaning beyond the everyday and create more than surface meaning. Look at this line from our poem, The Eagle. The wrinkled sea beneath him crawls. Tedison has used words to create meaning beyond our everyday understanding of the sea. The sea is turned into a creature crawling way below the eagle. We understand wrinkled to describe the waves and the movement on the surface of the sea. But we've not often thought of the surface of the sea as having wrinkles, like on someone's face. Also, waves that are normally powerful are portrayed as just being wrinkles. The eagle is in the superior position of being high up. To the eagle, the waves appear small, like wrinkles. So figurative language has given the reader a new or unusual way of looking at the sea in Tennyson's poem. Comparisons and giving human characteristics to things are examples of figurative language. Cecil Day Lewis, one of the greatest poets and critics of our time, claims that imagery is a picture made out of words. That brings us to our next focus, the poetic characteristic called imagery. Imagery is the mental pictures created by a poet for the reader. In all the poetry that we have read so far today, there has been a picture created in our minds. When we read Tiger, Tiger, Burning Bright, we saw the picture of the powerful, richly coloured tiger stalking prey. And that is what poets do for us. They create in our imaginations the pictures that they themselves see. And again, these pictures are not only created in poetry, but they are essential to poetry. Now let's move on to another characteristic that is frequently used in poetry, the symbol. A symbol is an object that represents something else, an idea, or a larger accepted understanding. Think about things like the South African flag or a white dove. These things represent ideas. Let's look at the South African flag. It represents our country but it also represents democracy, the end of apartheid, and freedom. The white dove represents peace, as we all know. Now let's look at what we have added to our list of characteristics that make our poetic writing. Emotive and effective descriptions, stanzas, rhyme, rhythm, figurative language, imagery, and symbols. Join me for our next lesson when we will take a look at the sonnet. Cheers!